welcome to this edition of Maximum Growth Live. I'm one of your hosts, Jay Ruane, CEO of FirmFlex, your social media marketing funnels for lawyers, as well as CEO and visionary of Ruane Attorneys, a criminal defense and civil rights practice here in Connecticut. Uh, some exciting news on that front I'll talk about today, Seth. Uh, with me, as always, that guy, Seth Price, CEO of Blue Shark Digital. Oh, no, you're you're not the – are you the president or the CEO? What is I'm it? I'm the CEO. Okay, but, you CEO. Know, but, but you know what's funny? It's essentially a chairman role. I do oversee business development. I'm there as a – but the, the team and what we're talking about today is like the <laughs> difference in work topics makes me like less and less – Part necessary of sausage making right exactly okay so he's that role at at uh at uh at blue shark he's also the managing partner at price benowitz dc maryland virginia pi family law obviously powerhouse criminal defense that's where he made his bones my man seth price seth uh you we usually start uh you had your anniversary this week at this past weekend you were in the city i was in the city we were probably within at, at points we were probably within 150 or 200 feet from each other and yet we didn't meet up so how you been this week it was great like i gotta say uh, escaping with the wife without kids cashing some star old starwood points things marriott points now live large you know in a way that like you and i like as the as the frugal entrepreneur points <laughs> for the hotel um we sat in the second row for patty the phone and a company where we're like all the way on the side but the cheapest seat in the house so we're like yeah. you know like 12 feet from stardom, uh, it, it was awesome. So we had some great meals, some great friends. Uh, you know, there's something just, again, New York is a drug. I miss it. I grew up there. It's not the same place I was. But what I love about getting out is that it allows you to flex muscles. One of the things, you know, we have a lot of entrepreneurs on this listening to this. And the thing that kills me about New York City is the expense and obstacles to doing anything. Now, the prize is you get to live in New York. Um, right. But, you know, just to give you an idea, Sarah Beth's for brunch, three pieces of hollow French toast in an order, a la carte, nothing else. What's the over-under? What do you think? 20, I'm going to say $29. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> to me, no, no, but, no, no, but you're, you're doing that too because you're sort of like, you're giving me the real number. Like the mean... rest of the world, French toast, the over-under is $14, you know, not, casual 12, not casual 16. Whipped cream was extra, you know, and, Anyway, so I, I so it's funny. I was yeah, I, just funny about that. I actually remember going to the King Cole Bar there at the uh, St. Regis uh, to meet up with a, a woman I was I had met. We were going to go on a date, and uh, I was like, oh, you know, that's just easy for me to shoot into the city because I, you know, I live in Connecticut, but I can come in on the east side. And uh, I, I remember saying, you know, I was asking another friend, do you think that's going to be complete? So like, that's fine, but it's going to be a twenty-seven dollar glass of white wine. And I was like, yeah, well, I guess it is. And uh, well, you're shooting into the city for an hour and a half to meet her, you might as well make it. A, I mean, that I didn't realize how much has transpired at that King Cole bar. The actual Bloody Mary was created. Yep. You speak the Red Snapper. That, no, that's, 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 that's a so trivial pursuit still question. It's there. But the idea, just branding, right? Red Snapper yep. wouldn't have done it. But Bloody Mary, it's a part of the American vernacular. You know, it's funny. I was um, I was in the city. We went to go see uh, the Music Man with Hugh Jackman and Sutton Foster, and it was awesome. Um, but when I pulled in, you know, we came in on Sunday marathon. It was the half marathon, the half, I the guess. Half marathon. We, we literally leaving to get to our friends on the west side, going to Hudson Yards. We took a cab for three blocks. It stopped. We got out, walked from fifth to eighth with our luggage, and they got another cab from eighth to eleventh. Yeah, so we're we're coming in. We're we're jammed up in traffic. I pop out and talk to one of the cops there, and was like, "Look, yo, I just got to get to this garage because I was just trying to get over one more block so I can get close enough to the restaurant and the theater." Uh, so we get into the garage. I pull in, and th you know, there's a ton of guys there coming in and coming out. And I see my man, the the parking attendant. I, so I whip out a twenty. I'm like, "Yo, I need a VIP spot." Uh, and he goes, I got this run right in front, right on the street. It's yours. So I was in it. And when I when we left, my father and uh, brother had parked in the same garage. They waited 45 minutes to get out. I was out in under two minutes. They you know, literally, I, I paid the ticket. Like, he tossed like, me the keys and I was out the door. $20 millionaire, baby. It's awesome. No, no, no. And that's, but that's why in New York, the $27, everything is 20 Like the tip, 
look, I literally, I, we're digressing way too much. I was in, a, I was taken in the middle of Central Park. A guy comes running after me, point, we need you in the show. So now I'm in the middle of 500 people watching the show. The show was more of a shakedown. It was a, uh, an acrobatic show, but they basically go around getting money from everybody before they do their final act. I'm standing in the middle like a, a stooge with 12 other guys, all, you know, like well-dressed white guys. We're sitting there in a row. This is the African-American guys doing it. They go around getting $20 bills from everybody on the outside and then go down the row. And you're basically, if you don't give them 20 bucks, they're going to like humiliate you. My wife decides that she, they're going to literally put you on the back of the jump so that you have the most chance of getting hit. <laughs> uh, and, and like literally what was two, three dollars for street performers, it is now a $20 pass to watch if done well, by these well, that, that brings me to our topic for today. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of interesting having been, you know, growing up in New York City in the 90s, right? New York City in the late 80s, early to mid 90s. I was running around back then. You were running around back then. Not in the same circles, um, but, but we were both sort of running around. And there was a certain way things happened in New York. And you sort of, you ran with it and, and that type of thing. Now... Like you said, it, it's it's a little it's a lot different, right? And that translates a little to how just people communicate. Because in my office, and I'm sure in yours at Price Benowitz, although Blue Shark might be a little different, so that'll be a conversation. In my office, we um, we've got my father, who is as old school lawyer as they come, refuses to show up in the office without wearing a full suit. That's just who he is, right? Um, and then we have younger lawyers who, uh, you know, baggy jeans and, and tank tops are cool with them as they're getting their work done. They're not going on camera or going to uh, anything. And that's how they're going to dress. And, it, and it's interesting. Um, when we had our retreat 10 days ago, we talked a, a little bit about problems with technology. And one of the problems was um, my father was upset that people were not buzzing him at his desk when he got a phone call. And the response from the reception team is, how do we know you're at your desk? And his response was, well, because it's a work day, I'm always at my desk. And they're like, well, we don't know that. And we've got 29 other people here that are all over the place. We never know where they are. So we slack them and that's it. Well, before, uh, before his son took over, there, it was him and a person. They knew where he was. You messed up his right. whole deal. I messed up his whole deal. But, well, but, but let's talk a little bit about over. the differences in how generations communicate can really impact your law firm, especially as you scale. If you have people that are older and you're hiring younger people, uh, or you're bringing somebody in, how has that impacted your firm? Well, look, it is, I, I feel like there's a book coming someday. I'm writing a book right now, digital marketing, but like the, the there's, I, I, and I don't profess to be the expert in it, but I get to see a couple snapshots, not only with clients of Blue Shark around the country, Price Benelitz and, and, and Blue Shark itself, what I'm seeing, look, we're talking about the great resignation. So before we even get to communication, right? A lot of velocity, which means you better keep people happy or you're in a lot of trouble at this moment in time. Economy's still good, lots of, but lots of opportunities. And part of keeping people happy is communication. And law firms in general, when I look at groups that do a really good job espousing culture, you know, Chris does its seminars on it. Um, within Blue Shark, we took an EOS test. We don't use EOS uh, currently at Blue Shark. We got an 83, 84. That's like 20 points higher than law firms aspire to get to. I mean, crazy stuff. But again, it is a homogenous, not including me as an outsider group that is very, very good at understanding cultural touch points and making these things work. Um, on the flip side of this, is a law firm with all the legacy problems, right? You got your dad's style of communicating, you have yours, you have young associates. Uh, you just mentioned off air, you had an associate, you know, bolting out in the four o'clock hour, stuff that a generation ago probably would have been terminable, you know, termination yeah. level. Now it's like, who cares? The person like, am I, you know, some, some mom or, or some young attorney goes home, wants to like grab happy hour while the drinks are still half, half off and, and logs in and does a couple hours of work at night, you know, God bless. What I see a blue shark though is really interesting, which is the grind, which is what got me where I am, which is you're never off. You're even on a vacation, you're checking emails and texts, you're, you're, you're dinner with your family. As soon as it's over, you may check your phone sometimes at the table, right? 
the, the world that I am seeing, management all the way down, is a nine to six mentality. Now, if the house is on fire, they still have their phone. They're not like ignoring you and they will deal with a crisis. But from a personal style lifestyle, it's very much about are you going to, you know, are you quality of life, which goes to, you know, sort of this point where I have struggled personally, particularly on the law firm side, with older lawyer talent not getting that memo that what makes people drive today, you can't push as hard as I push, or these people make me look like a softie, you know, as far as our requirements, availability. I start at 7 a.m. I'd love to be able to call people at 7. I know that I have like the best 8.30, realistically 9. 9 is the time I'm going to start getting people, if not 9.15. If there's a real reason, I'll push it, but I'm not. So for people that never got this memo, it's becoming a real cultural you know, piece. For your dad, who cares? He's at the meeting, tell people he wants us. But when I have people that are direct subordinates to people, and I track where turnover happens, it happens because somebody else is not getting the memo and saying, hey, this is... The, the lawyers under 35 aren't playing the way that we saw people as they were on partner track. Attempt. And frankly, the partner track doesn't exist anymore. You go to big law, right? Used to be right. eight years up and out. You did eight years. You became an equity partner with no book of business. Around the time that I would have been, uh, I came out in 95. So let's say early 2000s, after the economic bubble in 2001, the big firm said, F it. You know, you're made based on book of business. And that trickled down to everybody, which means that without that carrot, that you're going to be given a golden handcuff you can't live without that sets you up for life as an equity partner, you know, everything we do is about keeping people engaged, happy, and employed. And if the if part of your senior management lawyering doesn't have that in hand, it can be pretty detrimental. It's something I'm sort of struggling with right now. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You know, one of the things that we are pushing in our recruiting um, is sort of that work-life balance, work-life integration. You can work from home. You can work from the office. It can be a hybrid. Just get your work done. Obviously, if your work requires you to be in court, you can't say I'm not working mornings if that's when the court is because not everybody is progressive as we are. But certainly, you can uh, avail yourself of those opportunities. And and it is, you know, I, I don't want it to, but it does sort of irk me when I see all my associates leaving and I'm still the last one here. But I got to remember, I'm the entrepreneur. This is this right. is my thing. And, and it's in my blood to work till midnight. My, my marketing team is constantly joking on, at their weekly meeting about, well, how many slacks did you get from Jay after midnight? And they're and it's like it's like a bet. They, they see who got the most for the week um, because I don't expect response. I told them straight up, look, I'm going to slack you my ideas when I have them. Uh, and and you got to just understand that yeah. I do not expect a response at three yeah, thirty in look, the morning. I, I just had it with a service provider, it. one of the uh, homework consultant therapy type guys for one of my kids. You know, he, we have a package where it's it's a flat rate for the kid to text. We send him a text to update him on something, and he goes bills me an hour and a half on it. I'm like, what the hell? This is the, I'm just dumping information. You know, so it's it also is what is immediate, but. If you're crazy like us, and I think that's what the millennials and the Gen Zers are saying is, yeah, we don't want that. You know, you're dumping the stuff, but like I've now moved to dumping to email because it's not immediate there and not doing stuff like Slack and and, uh, and texting because even though to me it's like, yeah, wait till the next day, they see it and it interrupts their zen. And I don't like, again, it, it's it's changing. I can see it. You don't like, you know, like, fuck it. I want to be able to send a Slack because that's the mode that I'm on. But if there's a cost where it's where people are, if, if it if it if somebody if it's turning people like, off, yes, and so look, it's a problem it's great for to your say work for, life balance in your opening. It's great to say unlimited vacation, but if you can't take vacation and you want the person to be always on, that like what you and I think of work life balance may not be what they think. Well, you know, it's funny, just talking about this, and I'll pivot just a little bit. I was in, a, you know, one of the forums online, one of the Facebook groups, and somebody had said, do you ever feel bad about what you're paying your remote workers? 
um, because you're you're not paying them the equivalent of what they would make here. And, and the response was, you know, I've talked to my remote workers about it, and they're happy with their wage. I'm happy. I, I do give them bonuses, that type of thing. And what you have to realize is that everyone really is in a different position than you are, especially when you're growing your firm. When you're growing your firm, I mean, my foot is on the gas to the floor all day, every day. I do not take my foot off the gas. But even the people that are most committed to me in doing this, they're driving their own car. They're just driving it alongside of mine. And they might want to stop and smell the fucking flowers, well, you know? So, what, let me get, so this week at, at, at Blue Shark, something not client-facing, but an internal issue, I realized that, and I've known this for a long time, that one of the people we have, and I keep being told, oh, this person's going to get stuff done for you, isn't up to the task. Bottom line, they, they may be able to do other stuff and let them do that. They, could, they don't have the skill set that I need for something. My attitude is, I know it now. Get them off with their head. Not, they're not a bad person. Let them do other stuff, but make the move immediately. I'm like, are we recruiting for it? Well, we have recruiters, which in my world, for a company that's never really successfully used recruiters, the law firm does, the marketing company really does it very much. I'm like, that's not gonna, that's not gonna happen. So now the question is, you wanna step on toes? You want, I'm like, guys, like once you know it, why are we gonna wait two weeks? Now look, I get at some level the cultural piece where you don't want people upset, you want buying this and that, great. But it, it, it's a, it's a I, I personally struggle with it. It's sort of like what got you there may not be what gets you to that because I, I want to be what Gary Vee has been espousing. It's funny, we haven't talked about this in a while, but you know, benevolent and kinder and great. And is, but I know that that drive that got me to where I am now, if I had done, not be kind, that's not the point, but if I had sort of said, yeah, we'll wait three weeks, see what happens. Like that's not getting us to where we were, where, where, where we got to. And it's, it's a struggle because I'm sitting there saying, and it's almost bring it back to another conversation we've had. You know how we talked about like, if you have two employees, you don't need management. It's you have great margins, like two rental units. You could have two rental units and you get insane margins. If you have 15 rental units, you need a property manager, you need a repair guy. It's a whole, and your cost structure changes, decisions being made by them. The person placing the tenant isn't you. They're not noticing, hey, that guy's a heroin addict, going to destroy my house. There are all these different pieces. And I kind of feel like it's almost similar. If you want to have something that's smaller, you could have foot to the pedal. But as you grow, if you, if you do that, it can upset an apple cart, particularly the way with people want to be at the moment, that is disconcerting. So I sort of have to say, okay, my gut is to do this, but I know intellectually that that's not what is wanted. At Blue Shark, luckily I have David Brett who translates. He's literally like almost like a translator for me between what I want to do and what happens. And, I, and, and our chief operating person is now at this point literally a – Filter, almost like a co coffee filter, where I can dump the stuff in, unfiltered, literally. Say this person's a dumb fuck. Why can't they do this? Please do that. And it comes out the other side as culturally appropriate, not culture, but like culture appropriate communication that doesn't upset the apple cart. Well, yeah, because you don't want you don't want to you know step in to a company that's otherwise running well and do something that's going to cause resentment or people to be suspicious people to start you know polishing up their resume like like you know no, especially now, historically, like, so. like i'd push really hard somebody would get offended i'd walk with them to starbucks i'd smooth it over we'd go back to work literally that was my playbook for a long time not proud of it i'm just saying it was push as hard as we needed to to get ourselves look we scaled to 40 freaking lawyers without a multi-generational firm it, it doesn't come without a push you don't right. push, you'd sit, I'd be sitting there with Dave in his, in his basement. So it's, it's, it's knowing that I don't want to give, it's frustrating. I don't want to give that up. At the same time, if I, it, it, there are huge costs to it and like immediacies, again, part of it is basics. I've been told, you know, make sure you talk to people in a private closed door office. Now, the great thing about COVID is nobody was there. So, you know, but it is it is definitely a pull and tug and a dis, and hard in that there's stuff you want done you see it my vision is i know what it's going to take to get there and i'm like having to allow others to do it at a pace they feel comfortable at which is just an infuriating thing. it's not your pace and that's and that's a problem 
I mean, and and it's something that we sort of have to, you know, like bite the lip and and, and bite the inside of the cheek and just sort of let it happen. I, you know, I'm I'm curious though, as people start to grow, if they truly do realize, and and I'm setting this up for all the people out there that are solos or solos with you know one or two uh, assistants, maybe a you know a, a maybe a lawyer and a paralegal uh, that are helping them do their thing. And they say, okay, I, I need, to, I want to get to 10 people. That's my next goal. Uh, I wonder how many of them are actually thinking about these things now, because if, you know, it's almost like, at least, I don't know about you, but in my experience, I was less profitable at 10 people than I was at 20. Uh, and so it was like a dip where oh, I started, no, no, that, that was like, what I was alluding to a minute ago, yeah. right? What I was saying was there's a profitability at, at smaller that if you want to grow there, like, and I don't know where the exact number line is, but there is a point like first single with an assistant. And then you're like, well, if I had a second assistant, so then you like start doing, well, if I want now as an associate, well, there's a huge problem. But as you build that, at some point, you're not doing it yourself. Now, it's better. It's the right move in, intellectually, business-wise, that you're not doing basic managerial office stuff but each piece comes with you know uh associated headaches and extra dynamics that need to be dealt with yeah absolutely so okay next topic that i want to talk about is actually uh sort of a callback to the top of the show we talked about being in new york city the next time i'm going to see you live is in what three weeks uh at john fisher's mastermind experience i'm really looking and, forward and to spending some time craig oh yeah and, and craig golden farms before. the day before um, which we are both going to be speaking at. Um, but I sort of wanted to, you know, this a lot of, I saw some questions uh, come up recently online uh, and, and I often get them in DMs. Uh, it's one thing I want to talk to you a little bit about is something that I'm thinking about uh, starting up. Um, and it's, you know, what is out there for the growing lawyer and growing law firm? You know, there's some groups, there's some great groups. There's like a uh, lawyer on the beach, right? Um, and that group is all about how to set yourself up to work remotely, uh, you know, not have to be, you know, in court intensely, that type of thing. It's not necessarily about growing your firm. It's more about growing your lifestyle. And well, having people your who party. don't go to that, they keep that because not growing means you have certain headaches. You may be on the beach, but you're the office manager. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but, you know, so I, I, I want to make this a two parter. Let's start this okay. off and, lead, and, and sort of because this is a longer conversation. But it's a, it's a good one. Let, let's sort of kick it off because a lot of people say, what are the best legal conferences and you know, what's the best groups? To be and there, the answer is it depends, right? Like anything else. Like anything um, else, it depends. And why don't we start this? Look, we, we, there are look, everything from Max Law to Lawyers on the Beach to, um, to, to, to what uh, Craig is doing and what, what John is doing. But in doing that and looking at all those different options that are out there, like what Crisp is doing and, and Ken Hardison, there, there, there's no shortage of opportunity, a large group goes over to HTM or how to manage, but you, in talking to you, you sort of saw that there's a hole because many of the groups are small firm entrepreneur. I'm going from, you know, a couple hundred thousand to closer to a million. Right. Um, there are, there's no shortage of stuff in the PI space. Clearly that is the most service. There's the most money. The lawyers, frankly, have the most time compared True. to people that are in other areas where they're in court every day. PI lawyers are rarely in court by comparison. Um, and that, um, you know, you, you've sort of been uh, beta testing something, dealing with the verticals. Because, look, the way you and I met originally was through a oh, PI yeah. marketing group. Exactly. And while the college and the uh, NC, uh, the and DOIDLA are still, are still there, there's really not many resources, particularly in the criminal vertical out there. And I'm just curious to see what you're up to. I've seen little you know, snippets of it online. What, what, what's going on? So that's one of the things, you know, my, my heart is with the criminal defense lawyer, the, 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 the men and women that are like my father, who just really, you know, they have a practice that they love. Uh, and haven't really been able to do some, you know, make the kind of money they want with the practice that they love. Because, right. you know, let's face facts. I mean, criminal law, I, I'll make a statement for most criminal lawyers out there. Um, we get paid on half of our cases. We would work our cases for free most of the time. Most criminal lawyers 
um, you know, never get paid for their trials, but they'll do it because and the, and they'll and they'll well, that, that, that's that, that 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 there is at first I was like, what are you talking about? But no, that is the crux of it, right? Let's yes. assume they paid on cases. That to me, intellectually, the business person is one of the greatest dilemmas. You need the trials because A, sometimes you have to, B, yep. if you don't do them, you don't get the plea deals. But economically, particularly as you move out of the misdemeanor world and the felony world, almost nobody can afford the afford trial. trial. And then you almost do an insurance plan where everybody gets charged a little bit in case they go to trial, which hurts you when they when you go to like quantum merit or earn money. But that is one of those sort of like dirty secrets that like if you really charge people for the hours on a criminal case for something that pleads versus in the one out of 20 that go through a full trial. Those full trials, but let's take a homicide for you. Nobody can really afford a full homicide trial short of a somebody liquid with millions of dollars. Yeah, I mean, I, I think back to um, like the last private pay monster murder case here in Connecticut was the Skakel case, uh, and they had the they had the money, right? Uh, they had the money to go around. Oh, and, two and, things. And, the, the irony. Look, Mickey Sherman. Uh, great guy and father of a good friend of both of ours but if that's the last one that paid full freight the irony is that like even like according to what we've read it was not a great situation either so right. it, just, it just i mean it shows you that there aren't like if that was the one that it, it's a crazy nonsensical world that People do homicides either for the experience or because they love them. Oh, they love they're it. They're not making a living doing it. They're not. Exactly. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to put together sort of a, uh, a, a monthly mastermind around the principles of running a profitable criminal business. Because I know I've been able to do it. I know you've been able to do it. Uh, and so that's what I'm looking to do is just sort of help these lawyers that are out there, you know, with a few tweaks. Um, you know, Chuck in Indianapolis is going to be able to identify his market, go after it. Be satisfied that he's making money, and what, and, and honestly, do what I did. I, I was, I used to tie the money away, so I would take a percentage of every fee uh, that came in and put it into my trial, uh, trial fund, uh, so that when a client needed a trial, I could do it, and I could afford to do it for nothing because I had this, this fund where if I wasn't going to be able to sign up any new cases for two weeks because I was going to lose the you know that that instant sale opportunity right. of me being able to call people in the afternoon because I was down deep into a trial um, right. I was going to have a buffer to be able to do it and that's how I got my 37 trials I would not have that now I mean it's it was been a struggle the last couple of years to even get those trials and I I can't imagine some of uh, some of these younger criminal defense lawyers struggling to get trials, especially coming out of COVID, um, that, you know, when the bigger things happen years down the line, uh, it's going to be troubling because they're not necessarily going to have the experience that they need to be able to command and quote those bigger fees, which is necessary if you're going to do it. I mean, if you're putting in the work, you should get uh, you should get your your money for it. So I'm I'm going to be launching um, probably in the next couple of days a, a, a criminal law specific uh, annual mastermind program. It's a, I create a 12 month sort of course that we're going to take people through. I'm going to invite just criminal defense lawyers, nobody else, my people. Um, and it's going to be just a way for people to sort of, um, follow my well, look, the, the truth is you, you had a mastermind online and what I've seen, cause I've been part of a number is that unless you charge something for it, it likely doesn't happen. Like you had one, I was, I showed up a few times. But it, do, it doesn't, so it sucks. As, as somebody who's like frugal, I'm like, why can't I go to free stuff? But unless right. there's some sort of a buy-in, and I think we'll talk more about the models of these different ones, but I want to leave you with this, because this is what I would love to see unpacked, which is when pricing things, right? Assuming you're not doing stuff as a criminal defense lawyer by the hour, which is clearly the easiest way to do it, but that you end up into people not paying you on the trial, that... I'll give you what, what I remember. I'll give you old numbers. But in the old days, um, guys in my office wanted to charge $3,500 for a DUI in D.C. And it they were trying to figure out, hey, I'll charge $2,000 if it goes to trial or four and six for a higher, higher end guy. And the problem was other guys were saying, well, I'll include the trial. And we're, they, they, we're, they're basically saying, you're charging $6,000. I'll charge something in the fours. And what I came up with was, okay, instead of charging four and six, charge 4,500. You need something. 
because you don't want it to be there's no charge to go to trial because if you charge nothing, you go, ah, I'll just roll the dice and it's a lot of your time. I'm not right. thinking about a lot, but something, almost like a copay. Like somebody, you charge something for your insurance. You know why? I remember the big firms telling me because if their spouse has it and they don't really need your insurance, but I might as well have it. You want something so that it's not just a throwaway, just like we're talking right. about mastermind value them. But what is the optimum level of charging for the trial, but not knowing, let's say I'm making this number up, but assuming the trials are one out of 20 on a DUI where it actually goes to trial, are you better off as you almost did having that fund where it could be three, four, five, six hundred dollars extra beyond what you think your pre-lit case is, your your and that you're essentially getting that buy-in each time so that you can afford to do it. Because if you really charged for the time of that trial at let's say five hundred dollars an hour, you'd be at you know twenty thousand dollars and nobody's gonna pay you that on the DUI. Right. You, and so I'd love to think about this, these sort of- you know, So business. my situation for years was I would get the, you know, someone would say, okay, I have the 10,000 or 15,000 to pay you for the DUI trial, right? And, and I'd love to do it. And then like, but I don't have any money for the experts. And so then I'd lose 7,500 of it going to the experts. No, no, and and so, 100%. And to the point where when we saw uh, juveniles in DC, no, our, our friends and mentors, the guys who taught us in law school, were running that department, the public defender. I'm like, if you have 7,500, go, and, and they would get you that, go spend it on extra experts. Don't spend it on us. Um, yeah. And you would see that because if you don't, if you can't do the experts, it's not going to, we're not going to be able to get you that same result. Yeah. I mean, for, especially in the DUI stuff, you, if, you're, if you have a, a test number, you need an expert to sort of explain why that test isn't accurate because so many people will just hang their hat on that, uh, on that number. I mean, the way I solved it a lot of times, to be honest with you, was I actually, instead of being, you know, 4,000 and 4,000 for the pretrial and the trial, I would break it up. I'd go 3,000 or 3,500, and then I'd actually charge a trial prep fee uh, because so many of my cases would get on the trial list and then resolve at the last minute. No, you know, and, that's genius. I love that. Yeah. So I would charge, I would charge like 5,500 or 6,000 for trial prep right. and then three grand for the trial and, and tell people, I love doing the trials. So I'm not going to charge you a lot for that, but I spend my time prepping the case. I make my money on that. And then if it folds at the last minute, I don't have to give back all the, all the majority of the fee because I've earned it by prepping the case for trial. Um, that's no, how I, that's I, how I solve that problem. If anybody's out there, it's a great way. It's sort of that tiered process, and that's one of the things that we're going to talk about in my in my uh, law firm accelerator, my criminal law firm accelerator program. I love it. Um, yeah. We got we got lots and lots of good stuff here. Uh, can't wait to, to dive into this next week. Yeah, I'm 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 looking forward to it. This is, I'll, uh, I'll I'll let you guys know uh, as we start to as we start to ramp it up because I I think I'm going to keep it very small. Um, and it's going to be, you know, invite only sort of just the people who uh, I know I can help criminal law, criminal lawyers. Um, I, I don't need to be everything to everybody. Um, and uh, of course, I'll still participate online. If anybody has any questions, they can always DM me. Uh, I like doing I like helping people out as much as I possibly can. Uh, but that's going to do it for us today here, Seth. Uh, it's, uh, it's been another wonderful day with you. Uh, a little, a little stuff, not really, um, you know, solving problems, more giving people no, but, things to think about, get, which is, I think is look, important as people grow. You know, we can't in 30 minutes solve the generational gap problem, essentially. Yeah. Um, and so the fact that we, you know, you start, at least you're thinking about it. And that to me is what the value of the show is. Yeah. I mean, it, to be, to be quite honest with you, I, I, would love to think of myself as being the generational cohort as the lawyers that are working for me, but yes. I am not. No, no, I, look, I, I got I got to go. But I, I, every time I thought in, in, again, dating, I could talk to any potential interview candidate. And if there was a jump ball, I could win it. I can't do it anymore. I don't connect the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, folks, so that's going to do it for us. Please, if you want to take us on the go, be sure to catch up with our podcast available wherever podcasts uh, can be downloaded. It's the Maximum Growth Live podcast. It's got a great cover, season 2022. We've already got 10 or so episodes in the books. You can go back, listen to all of our historical episodes there as well. If always you want to catch up with Seth, you can do it by following him at Blue Shark by Price Benowitz or by following his law firm insider or 
Digital Marketing Insider. Oh, we didn't um, even get to Shake Me. Let's talk about him next. Oh week. yeah, we yeah. Before we before we end this, folks. No, no, no let's just we'll, just, just kick. We'll kick. We'll kick it down there. You tell him what it is. We'll just kick it down the road. Okay. And talk about it. So really interesting for his law firm as well as Blue Shark. Seth has actually brought on a genius in the uh, marketing space, but just in the thought space. Peter Shankman, the creator of Help a Reporter Out. Uh, he's one of Seth's longtime friends. Uh, just a sort of, um, you know, it's interesting. He's, he's, he's got neurodiversity. He's got ADD. He talks about it all the time. I, you know, I, I loved his message that it was more of a superpower than anything else. And he's thinking five years down the line, every moment, every step of the way. So I'm really excited to see what he brings to you. We had him on this show early on. We did. Uh, like a year and a half ago. Um, and we'll, I'm really we'll excited to see what he brings to you uh, as a member of your team, just thinking about the future of client services, the future of how we can deliver legal services better, how firms are gonna change. Obviously now with, with uh, outside investment in some states out west, that's gonna be coming to the East Coast, how that's gonna impact firms and, and how they service uh, the clientele. Um, so it's really sort of an interesting time to have somebody as a futurist working uh, with you. And I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing because I think Absolutely. our listeners are going to benefit from that. Um, and then, uh, of course, if you want to catch up with me, you can join me at my Systemizing Your Law Firm for Growth uh, or be on the lookout if you're a criminal defense lawyer for my law firm accelerator for criminal lawyers. But that's going to do it for us. We'll see you next week on another edition of Maximum Growth Live. Bye for now. Oh, 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 oh,